All right, well, uh, hello again, as I said, uh, thank you all for, for being here on time. Uh, we have a few more people who have subscribed to this event and they'll be joining us later, but not to take too much more of our um, time, I'd like to announce the beginning of our event today. Uh, my name is Gabor Karvitikian, I'm the Director of the International Programs at European University of St. Petersburg. I have with me today my colleague and the Academic Director of the NFO Program, Professor uh, Nikita Lomagin. Um, and uh, finally, we have our guest here, uh, Dr. Mikhail Krutikin, a partner in the independent Rus Energy uh, Consulting Agency. Uh, Dr. Krutikin is not, uh, has been our guest previously as well, uh, at least once online, I think in the last spring of this of a pandemic. And before that, he has also been a guest of, uh, of ESP here offline or in person. We're very happy to him to have him back in, in St. Petersburg in a very nice sunny day as well. Um, we still announce the event in, in, a, in a mixed format, so most of our uh, audience uh, will be will be in Zoom. But we're, it's, it's still a great chance to uh, meet Dr. Uh, meet up Dr. Prudikin once again here in, in Petersburg. Now today's uh, topic, as uh, as a lecture of the Energy Workshop series. Uh, is, is titled, um, Is There a Future for Russian Oil and Gas? Right? Uh, we will have, I guess, 30 to 40 minutes of, of talk by Dr. Kutifin, or as far, as far as you would like to take. And the event altogether will take up to an hour or an hour and a half, depends on how it goes and what your questions are. Um, Dr. Krutikin uh, has a great experience in, in working in the sphere of um, consulting. Uh, in, on, on energy politics, you know, he has a great lot of experience that he could, I, I guess, potentially share with our with our students, be that today or in the future as well. Um, and I'm very happy to have him here again, as I as I said. I won't take too much more time, and I think I will give the floor to you, Dr. Kurdish. But before that, my last um, housekeeping announcement. Again, I think most of you are here more or less the same people who were here yesterday, but just in case to repeat, because this is going to be recorded and uploaded on, on YouTube, I kindly, kindly ask you all to have your camera switched off while we are listening to uh, Mikhail Kurtikin. Then at the end, when we uh, start the Q&A session, or even during the speech, please feel free to send your questions in the chat, raise your hand in Zoom, or turn on your cameras and ask your questions. All right, thank you all. Well, thank you for inviting me. Hello everybody. Uh, I think this is a very uh, lively uh, question, which is the title of the lecture. And uh, to explain why, I am going to uh, read a quotation from the Saudi Crown Prince, Mohammed bin Salman, the main decision maker in Saudi Arabia in the energy business and in the economic business. And this is what he recently said. The United States, for example, will not be an oil producing country in 10 years. Today it produces uh, like 10 million barrels. After 10 years, it will barely produce 2 million barrels. In China, they are producing 4 million barrels. In 2030, it will reach zero barrels of uh, or very insignificant. Russia is producing about 11 million barrels after 19 or 20 years, it will only produce 1 million uh, more or less barrels. So the supply is declining much quicker than the decline of the demand for oil, and the demand will increase as expected by the supply will reduce gradually. We will uh, we will great uh, we will reduce uh, gradually after the uh, the years in. Uh, Saudi Arabia, on the future, it will increase its production uh, to cover the need of oil. That's a very interesting quotation, especially when Russia is concerned. And in about, well, maybe uh, 19 or 20 years, Russia is not going to produce the required amount of oil, and it will produce hardly enough to satisfy domestic consumption of oil and uh, abandon the markets, the global markets for oil. Uh, is it true or not? Uh, I remember in uh, 2018, the Russian Energy Ministry made a report to the, to the lawmakers 
and Moscow saying that unless new fiscal benefits are supplied for the oil industry, uh, oil production in Russia is going to decline about 40-43 percent by 2035. It means actually that Russia will, will not be able to export any oil, it will consume all the oil domestically. This is what the energy ministry says. Well, on the one hand, uh, the ministry is a lobbyist for uh, oil and gas companies in Russia, mostly oil companies, and so it uh, is pushing the government towards more tax benefits for oil companies. On the other hand, the arguments that the ministry is uh, supplying to the government are very, very interesting. First, the ministry says that of all the remaining oil reserves in Russia, only 30% are uh, recoverable, commercially recoverable, profitable to recover, and 70% are what they call tight to uh, recover oil or uh, difficult to recover. That's some Russian terms, but basically it means that 70% of remaining oil in Russia can be produced, but only if the prices of oil are very high, over $80, billion, $80 for uh, one barrel of oil. What it means? It means that right now, the Russian companies are trying to focus on producing uh, easy oil, so to say. The oil which is easy to produce and easy to sell because uh, production costs are still low, it means that production is focused mainly in so-called brownfield projects. The projects which were brought on stream many years ago, maybe in the Soviet era, and now are producing and they do not need any new investments, maybe just some kind of encouragement to enhance oil production from those oil uh, fields which had been brought on stream long ago and the production costs have been uh, compensated long ago and so they do not need any new big investment to produce that oil and so but it means that the companies are depleting very quickly depleting whatever reserves are still uh, commercial and recoverable and it also means that the companies are reluctant to go outside and to launch new production greenfield projects. Why? Well, Russia has some opportunities to with some, some resources which are still uh, can be considered easy to recover. But there are some problems. One of the problems is uh, that uh, an oil project takes quite a lot of time to get commercial. You will have a negative cash flow for seven years optimistically, or 10 years or 15 years, and you will only invest and invest and keep investing until you reach some period of time when you start getting profit from that product. And uh, well, 10 or 15 years in Russia is a very big uncertainty. I, uh, I suspect that uh, the oil companies are aware of political uncertainty in Russia, but mainly they uh, understand that uh, it is the matter of taxes. In Russia, in the Russian oil industry, taxes are uh, modified or changed two, three times a year. There was a period of three years when the taxation of the oil industry was uh, uh, amended uh, 22 times. So uh, the Russian companies, they do not understand how they are going uh, to keep investing in some oil projects for another seven, 15 years uh, without understanding what the profit is going to be, because the taxation is absolutely uh, unpredictable in Russia. And uh, this is the situation which I think has uh, no solution. Because basically the companies say, okay, we are going to go ahead with new reserves, with tapping new oil underground, 
if you give us uh, well, um, X benefits, which means that the Russian finance ministry must cut down in the expectation of future revenues from new oil, the Ministry of Finance must cut down its expectations of revenues from taxes from oil companies and so on. So on the one hand, it, it encourages the oil industry. On the other hand, the Ministry of Finance is not going to agree uh, to such proposals at all. So the solution is, uh, well, uh, avoided my imagination. I don't know how they can uh, do. Uh, then there is another problem with the Russian oil companies. When we hear that some big oil companies are prepared to launch new, tremendously large and extensive projects in the situation when uh, it is, is impossible to predict the outcome. You uh, take a look at those companies, they are state companies, Rosneft, for example. We see there is a huge new project of Rosneft, which is called Vostok Oil, in the north, on the Arctic coast, basically. And they say, okay, we need $2.6 trillion for 10 years in tax incentives, in tax, uh, well, uh, waivers, holidays, and so on and so forth. Okay, they hope to start selling that oil, and so uh, the company reports to the Russian president that we have a tremendously uh, large, important uh, project, which is going to produce maybe 50 million tons of oil, which is 1 million barrels per day, uh, maybe by 2025. Well, uh, we started getting suspicious. First, we started getting, we started getting suspicious about the uh, characteristics of that project. And then about the main decision maker, the actor. The company is governed by, uh, not by commercially minded managers of the regular commercial company but uh, by some people who uh, are closely associated with the political leadership of the country. And so the basic idea is not the idea of a commercial company, which is uh, minimizing the costs and maximizing the profit. Those guys in the state company, they hope to maximize the costs. As well, the budgets must be as large as possible with the fiscal encouragement from the government. Then the second suspicion uh, is about the characteristics of that project. Okay, they say in 2024 or 2025, we are going to export about 25 million tons of oil from a new port, which we are going to build on the Arctic coast. Okay, we are starting, uh, we start calculating. It turns out that every day they must load one tanker to send from the port of uh, high quality, ice resistant, Arctic class tanker. They do not have those tankers. They do not have the port. They do not have anything, absolutely. They say, okay, we've got plenty of oil to, to fill those tankers. They do not have tankers. They do not have the terminal. What about oil? They say, okay, we are going to use the oil from the uh, project we are developing right now. It is called one Port project. These two fields of the project are to be included as the initial supplier of oil in the term. And we uh, see the statistics of the project. Some three years ago, we produced 21 million tons of oil. Right now, 14 million. The production is declining. They are not capable to fill the, that terminal with the flow of oil, which they are promising to do. This one thing. They say, okay, we have a new field, Ayaha. And this Ayaha is going, we, we have checked, they say. We know that the field uh, contains huge amounts of oil and uh, the boss of the company, Mr. Session, uh, made a souvenir to Putin when he presented him with a crystal bottle of oil from that Payak field, 
which, which is high quality and it will be loaded in the factors from the new term. We uh, start looking at the reserves on that field. Okay, they managed to get a certificate from the government officials, which checked the size of the balloons. And they said, okay, you got their fabulous, absolutely fabulous amount of work. Okay. Uh, and then we see that it is in the category D1. What is D1? It is possible result, not proven, absolutely. When we compare D1 with actual reserves, which has been proven by drilling wells and obtaining some oil from wells, it is 1.5 million tons. It is not 500 million tons or 1.2 billion tons, as they say. It is an imaginary volume, which, which cannot be, this uh, proportion is, is absolutely impossible. Usually when you have D1, those uh, suspected or possible uh, reserves, you have maybe 30% of them might be transferred into the probable, and then maybe half of that may be transferred in proven reserves. So uh, this is first. They are exaggerating the size of this. They are not telling the truth about the plans of building that terminal. And they, uh, they just want to get money. So when we say that Russia is going uh, to increase oil production from Arctic oil fields, th this is... Uh, this does not bear simple checking. Arithmetic. Arithmetic is the main enemy of uh, government officials in Russia. And so we understand that uh, whatever oil Russia can produce now commercially, this oil is only maybe 30% of the remaining. It is not in the Arctic. It is not in the Arctic seas. Because in the Arctic seas, it's mostly gas, it's not oil reserves. So when we are speaking about oil, uh, I believe that 2019 was the year of the peak. It was a peak production of Russian oil. After that, it is going to decline. Because, uh, I remember when maybe three or four years ago, uh, experts predicted the peak of Russian production in 2025. Then it was moving to 2024, 2023, and now because of the COVID uh, limitations and the decline of demand, it is probably 2019. And this is a very important factor that depresses prospects of oil production in Russia. Another factor is, uh, well, uh, it's not COVID, it is the alliance of OPEC plus. Initially, Russia joined OPEC Plus and said, okay, we are going to support the initiative of uh, Saudi Arabia and start uh, producing less oil than we are producing now. And uh, we, we are going to support the level of oil prices at a convenient, uh, well, at a convenient level. Okay, then the Saudis saw that Russia was just promised to do that, but in fact, increase it well, production instead of decrease. For over a year, Russia was deceiving OPEC plus, saying that it is uh, a member of that alliance, but in fact, it was increasing well production. Then the Saudis last year in the spring, if you remember, there was a scandal when the Saudis said, okay, if you promise us to cut your production, but only 300,000 barrels per day. It is not very, very much, but you must do that, not just promise to do it. Then the Russian delegation just uh, announced they are leaving the OPEC plus lines, and they accused the Crown Prince of Saudi Arabia of undermining that deal, and he, and, you know, you don't do that in the East with those people. It's against their psychology. When you accuse a respectable and important 
Eastern official of lying or and that's uh, it, it, the, it's not excusable at all. And it was a huge scandal. And uh, the only solution at that time was, strangely enough, uh, well, the guy who managed to settle the affair was President Trump. He called uh, the king of Saudi Arabia, not the crown prince, which was very offended by the Russian attitude, and Mr. Putin, and the triangle. It was a triangle. Putin, the Saudi king, and Trump. And they reached an agreement that Russia will join the alliance and will cut down production not by 0.3 million, but by 1.3 four million. So the Russian, had, the Russian authorities had to apologize and they accepted the new terms of OPEC plus and started actually to cut down production. Well, maybe that was uh, the usual attitude of the Russian decision makers when they saw that they, their country is, uh, well, uh, has enough authority to sit at the same table with Mr. Trump and the King of Saudi Arabia. Russia is again a great power which can participate in international agreements and so on. Yes, I think it played some sort of a role. But the Russia in fact, lost at that time. And the Russian companies were ordered to cut down production. And in Russia, it's a very, very sensitive matter, because when you cut down production, you have to close down oil wells, which are produced. And in Russia, the majority of wells are very old, and they produce, well, a couple of buckets of oil per day. They, they, are not, they have to use pumps, either pumps that you see in the films going up and down, you know, those pumps, or electrical pumps, which are lowered into the oil well. And without that equipment, Russian oil production from a, a single well, an average well in Russia produced at that time uh, 8.3 tons per day. In Saudi Arabia, 1,000, 2,000 tons per day without any encouragement by pumps and so on. You just drill a hole and then oil comes as a pump in Saudi Arabia. In Russia, you will have to close down thousands of such wells to achieve the result that was uh, required under the OPEC plus agreement. And they started closing down uh, the least product, less productive wells, which were very old. Uh, and now the average well in Russia is 9.6 tons per day, which is the increase is a sign that old, many old wells were produced. And they were not producing uh, oil. They were producing well fluid, well head fluid, it is called, which usually is water with some amount of oil. In the legendary Samot Lore oil field in Western Siberia, it is 96% water and only 4% oil. So when they are closing down such wells, it is not economic to get new equipment and to recover the production of a couple of buckets of oil from those. The, you, you cannot return that flow of oil, which they are canceling right now. It's a great problem for the Russian oil industry. Uh, and so the companies, they prefer to do something with the brown field, with the old uh, fields that they are operating. They increase the number of wells. They uh, use uh, different methods of secondary oil uh, uh, enhancement, oil recovery enhancement, such as pumping water down in, in the ground, or using uh, hydraulic fracking, you know, the frack, which is called fracks, uh, 
They are using electrical, magnetic, biological, and other methods of enhanced production, but only with old oil. They are getting as quickly as much oil as possible just to get that money as, as quickly as possible. And so we are witnessing now the situation when the same level of oil production will never be recovered and 2019 was the peak oil production. So maybe I do, I do not think that the, the Saudi crown prince was correct. He was exaggerating quite a lot. But uh, what he said here is very important from one angle. Right now, we have OPEC Plus, which plays a very big role in supporting the oil prices at a relatively convenient level. And uh, well, everybody is acting in some well breaches of discipline, but still in unison. And uh, the Saudis uh, appreciate the role Russia plays because in uh, the world there are three big producers of oil: Saudi Arabia, Russia, and the United States. And two of them are in the same organization. They are acting; they are cutting production just to support the oil market. But I suspect that this is a temporary situation. For the Saudis, it is some sort of a compensation period. They lost a lot of money when the prices of oil was very low. They were low and they lost a lot of cash for their development programs. And now they are pouring the cash into their coffers. And they are expecting, as the Crown Prince said, that very soon maybe demand is going to decline to not only production, but demand. When they see that the demand in the world has come to a volume which can be satisfied by Saudi Arabia and some other oil producers with the smallest production costs, Russia will be out. Nobody will buy Russian oil for the price they want. Because if you compare the production costs, uh, it's, it's an elusive uh, term production cost because it depends on what you include in the production costs. If you include the same things for Saudi Arabia and for Russia, as in the, one of the uh, analytical reports of Restart Energy, a respectable Norwegian company, says they compared, they said, okay, to produce. Uh, one barrel of Russian oil uh, production costs will be $42 per barrel. For some, the same costs in Saudi Arabia, 17 So uh, Rus Russian oil is not competitive, basically. When the demand falls, it will be Saudi Arabia who is going to push all the competitors from that market. And Russia will be the first to go. Now, the most interesting question is, uh, well, the size of demand. Nobody knows what the demand of oil is going to be under, not only because of COVID, which slowed down the economic activities throughout the world. It will be because there is a huge uh, program of decarbonization and switching to new green energy in the major economies of the world. We see that uh, in Europe, in North America, in Asia, companies and governments say, okay, by 2025, maybe by 2030, we are going to ban or to limit the sales of uh, uh, usual cars. We want electric cars. And with usual cars consume about 44% of all the global oil. If uh, a lot of global economies switch to electric vehicles, then it would mean that the demand for that oil is going to go down. Well, the aviation consumes about 8% of oil, oil in the world, and 44 is for automatic transportation. So if you have electric vehicles, and they are encouraged in many countries, you will have the decline of demand. Then we see that uh, the green economy also uh, depresses not only oil, but gas, coal, and so on and so forth. 
We do not know what, what is going to happen. We have another Saudi uh, official, the Minister of Energy and Oil of Saudi Arabia, another prince, Delaziz, who says, okay, that program of International Energy Agency, the Paris-based International Energy Agency, is a sequel of La La Land. They say that uh, by 2050, it will be zero demand for oil all over the world. We do not have any demand of oil at all. So the Saudis still hope to get their share of demand. They are going to satisfy them. Russia is again, it is not a player in that game. Absolutely, because of the high costs, because uh, the Saudis have all the markets well um, well organized uh, logistics they are uh, good relations with the developed world russia has political problems russia has cost problems and russia has well some problems which are associated with the governance of the oil and gas industry because well some, sometimes people say well uh, what can russia do maybe to to slow down the decline of oil production, maybe to encourage some production of cheap oil and compete with Saudi Arabia and other producers. Well, then we have to turn to the obstacles, which are the obstacles to uh, enhance Russian oil production or maybe streamlining the system of producing oil. Well, uh, we are as we work with foreign investors we ask foreign investors uh, what are the problems of investing in russia and uh, well helping russia do what, what what you want and what russia wants maybe it is corruption no they say no 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 forget about corruption we work with uh, such, such countries as nigeria or turkmenistan it's we know we know what we are dealing with it's not russia it's not the main problem well, maybe it is the domination of huge state-controlled companies which do not allow you to access the necessary uh, oil assets. No, we work with Saudi Arabia, which have we work with the Norwegian Norway, where they have a share of state companies in each of the oil and gas projects. No, let's forget it. What 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 do we need? What what is the main obstacle? You know. Uh, security of investments we are not sure that first the russians are not going to change the rules the taxes and we are not sure they are not going to take away our possessions in this country it is Foreign companies have a lot of examples where when the Russian government behaved in a, well, uh, not, not a very polite manner. And so they are not sure they have, we cannot defend our rights, our ownership rights in Russian courts. You know what Russian courts are. So you do not have justice, you do not have independent courts. And so this is the main problem with uh, investment rights. Okay, this is one of the problems. Another problem uh, is, uh, yes, really domineering, I would say this is domineering state-controlled companies. In 1995, uh, the government uh, produced 7.5% of Russian oil. Well, the shares of the government in different companies, well, this is what was the government's share of producing oil. Right now, it's 63 under the slogan of privatization is our goal the russian companies uh, authorized rosnev to take and gazprom to take over private companies and there is no emkmdb no yukas no bashnev no itera no uh, that's a quite a big uh, list of companies that have become parts of state-controlled companies then uh, well Russian oil reserves are remaining oil reserves are scattered in small fields, small all over the country, with great distances, and huge companies cannot do those projects. You will need small companies to do this, small private companies, which can be innovative. They can risk 
money, they can risk applying new investment, just like, like in the United States. Thousands of companies can do what they want and they risk. This is why uh, the shale revolution took place because it was an initiative of very small companies which became uh, the trend for the national oil industry in the United States. In Russia, you, you cannot get, you cannot, they are discouraged. Oil companies cannot get what they want. So uh, then there is a problem of uh, new technologies. Because, well, if you want to, to get oil cheap from uh, the subsoil, you will need to apply some new technologies as other countries do. And we have sanctions. In many cases, it's difficult to apply technology because they are, the companies do not want to supply it to Russia. Well, then we come back. Well, sanctions are to blame, everybody says in the government. No, first, if you criticize the sanction, you should criticize the guys that provoked those sanctions, but not vice versa. Sanctions is just a consequence. It's not the initiative of those countries. So we come back to some political features of the whole picture. So instead of, uh, well, cooperation with the providers of advanced technologies, we have import replacement slogan. Import replacement is conservation of backwards. Because, well, we, we, uh, we cannot build a modern airplane without cooperation with other countries. You cannot build a refrigerator without, without cooperation with other countries. And uh, very many uh, countries understand that. You do not have any uh, American a brand of TV set or a fridge. They do not produce anything in America. That's Japanese. It's, it's Taiwan. It's, uh, they understand the assets of cooperation. In Russia, cooperation is, uh, is not encouraged. Then there is another problem. It's, uh, well, maybe it's psychology, maybe it's something else. But if you read the government, such governmental documents as the doctrine of energy security of the Russian Federation. Two years ago, they adopted the president's sign that, okay, if you drop out features and colors from that very small document, you will see that Russia is going to develop oil, gas, coal, and those fossil types of energy and uh, recoverable, uh, renewable energy, alternative wind, solar, and so on, they are called there in the document either risks or challenges. So the enemy. A very good example, we are switching to gas right now, <laughs> a very good example is the new fashion globally, developing uh, hydrogen economy, hydrogen energy. Okay, everybody is doing something to develop uh, hydrogen. Well, in the Russian government, they understood that they, they should do something like that. And they adopted a godly document, which is called the Plan of Actions. And after the Plan of Actions, they are going to adopt a hydrogen strategy. It is not yet finished, but Plan of Actions. When we are reading the Plan of Actions, 30 or something points in the Plan of Actions, uh, it is encouraging the development of something, assisting in the development of something else. Uh, it is made of mostly paperwork and promises. But the most discouraging feature of the document is uh, the identity of the uh, curator or maybe scientific uh, overseer of all the points in those actions, which is the St. Petersburg uh, Mining University. It is academy now, not university, yeah. or still university. Headed by Mr. Vigilenko, who is the enemy of hydrogen, renewable energy. So when you hear him speaking, he advocates the development of oil, gas, and fossil fuels. 
hydrogen is a challenge or a risk for him, and he is absolutely against that. And when he is appointed to oversee all the actions in the government, Len, we understand that Len is not going to come to fruition, so to say. So either you want a new type of energy or you do not want a new type of energy. We can go further. For example, people are start, start, uh, they start asking, well, what, how can we replace? oil, gas, and those fossil fuels, if the world is going to drop uh, its dependence on the oil and gas. Okay, some three years ago, in the Skolkova Energy Center, they prepared a report, an outlook of the global energy till 2040. And uh, my friends and I, we started asking the authors of that report. It was a very good report, by very realistic. Uh, well, have you analyzed some opportunities for replacement of oil and gas as the main exportable commodity of Russia? And they said it was Tatiana Mitro, who was the uh, chief of that research. And she said, you know, for three months, we collected the opinions of experts in all the economic uh, fields in Russia. We tried to understand them. What can replace oil? Zero. The result was zero. You cannot replace it. water, timber. I, I don't know. Diamonds. You, you just take a look of anything. Uh, a year ago, I, it was more than a year ago because of the COVID, I participated in a conference in uh, Qatar, Doha. It's a Muslim country. And uh, it was just as I expected. In the university, women were sitting on one side, men were sitting on the other side. But uh, I was astonished by the attitude of the audience, experts and students and postgraduate students. They uh, discussed a new type of economy, an economy based on knowledge, but not on resources. This is the country that is the world's largest producer of liquefied natural gas. They get a lot of money from oil, from gas, and they are dependent on that. And, they, and the women in the audience, they were more active even as men. And they started saying that we need an economy based on knowledge, but not on, nobody is going to need those resources anymore. People are going to need knowledge, information, innovation and we are going to treat that scientifically and critically i was taken aback it's an it's islamic country criticism is not allowed in quran or just do not doubt what what was said by the previous uh, wise people and even in that point so if qatar is going to move along the road to a knowledge-based economy instead of resources. And uh, I was ashamed because they asked me to do some examples of what Russia, can Russia be trusted as a participant of that new trend of going to the knowledge-based economy. Then I started producing the number of universities, the number of schools, the number of uh, deans, of uh, education uh, institutions who had uh, falsified PhD or doctorate dissertations. 30%, I think it was in, in the rest. Uh, then the quality of education, the quality of scientific work, the uh, brain drain, the flight of uh, capable people from Russia. Then, uh, well, basically, the uh, school education, the quality of the school education, we are not going where, where we should go. If uh, the money is spent not on uh, knowledge or development of uh, intelligent approach to uh, economy, I don't think we are going to, to be in the same race with the other countries. Well, I want to say a little about gas, natural gas. 
Well, uh, Russia has plenty of gas. It is number one uh, owner of gas reserves, and it is easy gas reserves. They do not need some very sophisticated technologies to get developed. And the only limitation is markets. And the market we see, the main market now is Europe. If we mean the natural gas by pipelines, and Europe is going to cut down the consumption of gas for several reasons. First, there is the general trend to uh, decarbonization. And then there is a very big competition with LNG. Because when, when, when you have pipes, you have uh, companies and countries which are dependent on those pipelines. If you do not, if they have access to LNG, then you cannot dictate to them political terms. You cannot uh, hope to be the monopoly provider. And it's, it's very important for gas firm. Because now when, when they ask me, well, what the price of gas is going to be, or how, how my gas, Gazprom, is going to export uh, to Europe next quarter, for example. I said, take a look at China. Why? The price. If the price of gas LNG in China is high enough to attract LNG producers from all over the world, then they will go to China, to Japan, and start selling their LNG, liquefied natural gas, in Asia. And in Europe, Gazprom will be free to fill, uh, fill down the vacuum with its own gas and increase supply. If the price is cheap in Asia, then gas will go will flow to Europe. We hear even well, very important people sometimes say, well, the Russian gas is going to compete with the American gas for political reasons. Well, it was even uh, Trump that said so. We are going, he said, to replace gas from gas with our LNG in Europe. I cannot imagine an American president sitting in the Oval Office and calling, inviting the traders of LNG and telling them to uh, sell their gas in Europe for political reasons because the system does not work like that. Uh, gas is produced in the United States, it is supplied to manufacturing factories. Then the companies that buy it are traders mostly. It can be Shell, it can be Trafiguri, it can be Polish oil and gas company. Anyone, anyway, they hire a LNG carrier, they take that gas from, and then they take it where the price is good, where they have contracts, mostly spot prices. They will not listen to Trump or Biden or Obama or anyone in the Oval Office. It is not competition with the United States. It is competition with LNG on the market. And LNG is Europe. Well, sometimes it comes from Russia. And a great amount of LNG that kind of ends up in Europe is from the Yamal Peninsula, where we have a project Yamal LNG. It is a very peculiar project. Well, when they say Russia is exporting LNG from Yamal, well, stop. stop. Russia is not exporting anything from the Americans because uh, the gas which is underground it belongs to Russia according to the constitution it belongs to the Russian Federation and people in the Russian Federation as soon as it gets up it uh, it is owned by the an international consortium Yamal LNG it is Novatec which is not completely Russian it has foreign ownership there. It is French Total. Now it is Total Energy. Uh, and then it is two Chinese companies. They own the gas now. They liquefy it and they sell it where they want. Because they do not pay any taxes at all. The Russian Federation does not get anything from that project. They have been given the right not to pay the royalty. The mineral extraction tax for 12 years. They do not pay uh, export tax, export cust customs duty. They do not pay profit tax. They do not pay income tax on the equipment they import for this project. And so, it, gas does not belong to, to Russia at all. 
They are exporters of that. They are the owners of the gas. It will be the same thing with the next project of Novatec, Arctic LNG2, which is slowly getting constructed. So when we say that Russia is exporting LNG from Sakhalin, it is, well, yes, 50% uh, belongs to Gazprom now, but it is Shell and two Japanese companies. It's an international consortium. So the consortium exports to them. So uh, LNG is a special, special topic. Just yesterday, I heard again uh, a Russian official saying, we are going to get 20% of the global market of LNG. OK, great. Uh, I heard 25%. I have heard now it is 8%. Russia sells LNG of the global market. I include the international consortium that produce LNG in Russia. And we start analyzing the projects which are being built and which realistically, realistically will be built to produce LNG. And even with uh, some sort of uh, adding some imagination, I cannot reach the figure of 20%. My maximum is 10.7%. This is the maximum. And realistically, it is 9%. Because most of the projects that are not, they are not going to move ahead. They have been announced. They have been well propagated. So forget about the great role of Russia as supplier of LNG globally. Yes, it will be a big supplier, but uh, Qatar, United States, and Australia will be the three largest LNG providers, and Russia will just supply some 10% of LNG approximately uh, on the, have a window of buy on the, that market. Well, increasing uh, gas supply by pipe. Okay, that was a great idea. On several occasions, Russian president said, okay, we are going to connect Eastern pipelines networks of gas with western pipelines and then we will switch the flow of gas from asia to europe and from europe to asia if the situation is better, better. So this is the well he i think he meant political blackmail but uh, well without even political considerations that was a strange idea because first the pipelines are not connected then if you look at the number of pipelines that go to Europe and the number one pipeline that goes to China and the volume of gas that goes to those distant destinations, you, you cannot uh, switch those flows of gas and obtain some political or commercial results at all. The Chinese with great problems, with great difficulties agreed on the power of Siberian project for 15 years, we were against the project. Now they agreed. Now uh, Gazprom is launching another one to build a new gas corridor from the north of Western Siberia to Mongolia and then to China. We calculated the cost of that project will be well over $100 billion because it's in the middle of nowhere. It's a very difficult terrain and uh, it's there is nothing just <laughs> building a new gas corridor to uh, Mongolia and then to China. The Chinese are silent. Uh, for many years, they disagreed with that idea. They said, well, we, we do not want a uh, transit country getting Russian gas. And they do not get, uh, they do not want that Russian gas at all. Uh, the volume that they have been uh, promised by uh, the power of Siberia, 38 billion cubic meters a year. That's quite enough for China. And this is a redundant project, which can be explained only by one consideration. When they were um, projecting uh, the power of Siberia 1, they, they forgot about the availability of reserves. There is not enough reserves to carry out the promises to China, 38 billion cubic meters. This is why they have to bring new gas from Western Siberia. It's not Mongolia. It's just to carry out. 
because I spoke with a Chinese official and said, well, uh, if you do not get the promised amount, don't get 38 billion cubic meters a year by 2025, what are you going to do? No? He said, we are going to charge Gazprom for covering the losses because we expect they promised to do that. And the price of that gas is very cheap. And when we see the information from the Chinese customs, they record the price of that gas because for Gazprom, this is a secret. We see that when uh, they sell in Europe for 230, 240 dollars per 1,000 cubic meters, in China, they supply gas to China, 138, 138, almost half of the price that they get, get from Europe. So this is both a political project, and as, in a sense, I think there is another another explanation to such project. Well, politically, Russia is going to announce we have a new outlet for exporting our gas to Asia. Good, good. For image building, that's perfect. But uh, the companies that are building those huge corridors of gas supply, they get money from Sada. Nobody else. Because Gazprom is a state company, is paying for that out of the pocket of gas from which is well, they, they could transfer it as dividend to the Russian ones. It could, could end up with the Russian economy. They are paying it to a private company that are building absolutely unnecessary companies. This happened with the North Stream, South Stream, Turk Stream, and those flows. Everybody says, no, it's, it's a very good commercial project. Take a look at it. it's the cost of the project in the Baltic Sea, less than $10 billion each one. North Stream 2, North Stream 1. Well, you forget a new gas transportation corridor from the Yamal to Minsula. Uh, I have a gas from document. It is open, it is not secret. It is a program of developing gas reserves on the Yamal Peninsula and adjoining seas. And it was finished in 2008. And at that time, they calculated the cost of a new gas corridor from Yamal to the city of Torajok. It is 2,200 kilometers, not reaching the Baltic Sea, not reaching the Black Sea. And the price was $92 billion. They counted it in gold. Uh, and the, the corridor has been built. It is, uh, nobody wanted that because, because the existing pipelines were quite enough to supply twice the amount of gas that Europe wanted from Gazprom. Then they built a new gas transportation corridor. Who was uh, who got the profit? Those private companies. You know that. So sometimes I wonder if it is those private companies who uh, advise the Russian president to take uh, to make the decision on building unnecessary pipelines, or it is the geopolitical ideas of the Russian decision makers, political decision makers that help those companies get additional profit. So it's open to speculations who, who is the main source of ideas and the cash flows. There. But basically, I think sooner or later, gas will also, it will be transitional fuel for a while. When they uh, will start uh, closing down oil uh, and gas, uh, oil and coal, and nuclear stations uh, producing uh, electricity. Natural gas will be replaced for a while. It will be a bridge between the green economy and uh, the current economy based on the, uh, coal, nuclear, and uh, oil. Well, but I don't think it will last forever. It means that gas, especially LNG from other countries, so Gazprom will find it more and more difficult to compete with the tendencies and with, with the competition. Gazprom has lost in the south, with the South Stream and the Turkish Stream, because we see that the southern Europe perfectly is fed by gas from Azerbaijan, from gas from Turkey, Iran, and the Balkan countries. They require microscopic volumes of oil. It's not a good market for Gazprom. It is not worth all that uh, 
money and uh, all that labor to build new pipeline, pipelines across the Black Sea, Turkish Sea. And uh, Italy, which is a main uh, consumer of Russian gas, 15 million cubic meters a year, 15 billion cubic meters a year, it gets gas from uh, by way of Ukraine. It does not want South Stream, North Stream, or anything else. And they say we want to keep that Ukrainian transit in place. So Gazprom does not get a uh, well commercial profit from those projects. And the geopolitical, I don't think it's a big victory. Even if they manage to finish uh, North Stream 2, it's not a victory geopolitically. Russia does not gain anything in this sense. It's, it's a huge problem. You, you know, just uh, last year, uh, I did a chapter in a book which has a new approach. Well, it's, it's a new structural approach in the United States. They have a new term, uh, weaponization of interdependence. <laughs> so they think, yes, we, we have a lot of interdependencies in our world right now. For example, internet or SWIFT in money transfers or maybe gas pipelines in some great area in Europe, for example. And everybody is dependent on everybody. It works. It absolutely works. In Europe, Gazprom well, everybody was, lo was loving and cherishing the agreements with Gazprom. And even uh, though there was some resistance from the United States, it was gas in the exchange for pipes in Germany and so on. And so nobody took uh, care, nobody noticed uh, the aggression of the USSR in Czechoslovakia. The same year, they signed the first contract for gas delivery in Europe with Italy, then Austria, then Germany, and so on. Nobody noticed the invasion of Afghanistan, because on that year, they signed the new uh, contracts for gas, gas delivery. And then in the year about 2000, the Russian leadership decided to weaponize that interdependence. So this is a snack in the interdependency. One of the well, nodes in the network might decide that this node is important enough to demand something with the other members of the same interdependence. And then Russia, with its Gazprom, decided to play a political role and started political demand, political terms, and the contracts, and so on. It failed. But uh, I think the idea is still very vivid in the Kremlin. They still uh, hope to get this promptly a uh, more political role in Europe or in China or somewhere else. I don't think they will succeed. And I don't think I will live to see the era where natural gas is not needed. <laughs> it will take quite a lot of time to get rid of that fossil fuel. But uh, I think they will not allow Russia to play a political role or to weaponize that uh, gas supply. Yes, some European countries are dependent, still dependent on gas supply. For example, in, if in the middle of winter, you switch off the gas supply to Hungary uh, in February, in the middle of the winter, it will not, it will not know where to get about 56% of its energy requirements without Russian gas. So some of the countries are still dependent on Russia, but the dependence is decreasing. They build interconnectors. They build new terminals for LNG, redundant, excessive terminals, but still they have some guarantees that they have against the Russian political dictatorship, so to say. Yes, with gas it is more difficult, but I think the trend shows in the, well, if it is interdependence, I think it will be better for everybody. Well, I think I can go on forever. Usually it takes me four hours to describe everything that I want to say. Uh, if you have some questions. Please. All right. Uh, 
Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Kutifin. Thanks for your uh, speech, for your talk, and for all the details that you provided. I hope that this was not just interesting, but provocative in, enough to you know, provide more thoughts, comments, and questions. Uh, before going on to the uh, question session, uh, I'd like to ask if Professor Lamagin, if you have any uh, further comments or additions or questions. Yeah, to me, uh, first of all, thanks a lot for coming here. And uh, I just wonder how be so skeptical and gloomy about oil and energy, you are able to stay in the market for eight years. <laughs> what kind of advice you give to uh, foreigners who come uh, to get this advice? You know, I'm, I'm sure that uh, your company is profitable. And uh, uh, just my, my question uh, <laughs> would be, uh, you know, about the type of business you do. If you discourage people to invest into Russia, uh, I'm sure that the flow of uh, uh, customers uh, 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 you know, uh, would be over <laughs> you know, within one month or two. So this is uh, just you know a remark. I'm, I'm I, I would say that uh, yes, it's true that uh, when we are talking about LNG, it's up to companies uh, to be traders, but it's to up to politicians to put pressure uh, on other governments. And uh, Germany, for instance, uh, made a commitment to build uh, LNG terminals. Uh, to receive LNG from the United States uh, being under pressure of Trump, right? So when, when you're trying to exclude politics from these contacts, it's, in my opinion, it's, uh, it's questionable. And of course, uh, from courses on political economy, international political economy, we all know that, you know, there are Theories up for absolute advantages and relative advantages. And uh, the fact that the production costs in Saudi Arabia is significantly lower than in Russia, it doesn't mean that Russia does not have its niche on the global market of oil. Right. Uh, so, actually, if the situation is as bad as you described, why Russian uh, reserves? Are, are growing, not decreasing. Why Russian exports is rather stable? Why foreigners, including Chinese or Japanese or uh, Koreans, are still willing to invest into uh, Russian projects in the Arctic? Why they invest? Mm, and do they see? Uh, any chance to make profits in Russia or they will just uh, abandon uh, uh, the uh, Russian market. So you, you are proactive. Uh, I, I, I'm going to be proactive as well, just you know, to see what you might respond. Ah, that, that's, <clears throat> I think we should regard uh, the attitude of uh, our company as a consultant company for mainly foreign investors in Russia in a different period of time. You know, when the, our company started as part of an American company, it was 1992, as early as that. And initially, when the Soviet Union fell apart, we witnessed um, an euphoria of foreign investors. Everybody wanted to come to Russia to launch oil and gas products, and we helped them obtain licenses, form joint ventures, and about 40, 41 companies were actually producing oil and gas, foreign companies were producing oil and gas in Russia in that period. Then came a sobering effect of a new uh, attitude of the Russian government about the year 2000 when uh, a period started, we were advising our clients how to get out of Russia with the pants still on, how to minimize the losses when they were getting out of Russia, closing down their business. And sometimes the losses were quite significant. Then there was a very long period of just monitoring the situation without actual movements Toward in the, towards investing in Russia. The only very large actors at that time remained who were Total, for example, Shell, BP, 
And uh, a member of the German uh, government told me once, you know, you can do big business in Russia on two conditions. You must be as, as big as uh, Volkswagen, and uh, he did not mean the car. Uh, and then you must be a personal friend of Mr. Good. If you do not have uh, those good relations, forget about big business in Russia. Yes, BP, ExxonMobil, in some period, Total, and uh, Shell. They made good business in Russia. The first representative of Shell uh, after the fall of the Soviet Union, Mr. Sergio Golubev, a Brazilian citizen, he told me, you know, we are even prepared to pay taxes, twice, the same tax twice, but to stay in Russia. We never left any country with our own will. So there are such people, different attitudes. Then after that, just monitoring for majority of players came a period of understanding that if you want to invest in Russia, it will not be in upstream projects in the exploration and the production of oil and gas. It will be a supply of equipment and technologies, finances, and uh, experience. And so mostly our clients now are not companies that are prepared to produce oil and gas in Russia, but suppliers of technologies, equipment, financial companies, which are watching the situation very closely, foreign embassies, which also prepare reports on their activities. But as to real investments in Russia, take a look at the chains. Okay, they do not have upstream projects in Russia. Uh, they, uh, Rosneft managed to convince them to sign agreements on two joint ventures in Siberia, and they were absolute failures. They do, not, they do not produce soil, they do not produce gas in Russia. They are members of Yamal LNG and Arctic LNG only because they want their share of production. It is their gas. And they deliver it to China regardless of the prices on the global market. It is their gas already. They do not pay anything for that. They got it. So in, on those terms, yes, they are prepared to operate. In other terms, well, it's very difficult. Some small projects still exist. Sometimes it's difficult for them to. A Norwegian company, uh, former Statoil, which is now Equinor, they signed a joint venture agreement with Rosneft to produce shale oil and gas in uh, southern Russia, near Orenburg. Then there were sanctions against shale, producing shale in Russia, they said shale. Then they looked at the product and said it was not shale. Shale is a specific type of uh, rock. But it was not shale. It was something else, geologically. And they changed the documents of the joint venture saying, well, we are going to produce tight reserves. Hard to produce, but not shale. In Russia, we have very limited amount of shale reserves. Absolutely. It's, it's another type of uh, geological material. Mm -hmm. Yes, they, they can do that on a limited scale. Mm -hmm. But we see that we, we cannot advise anyone to come and to launch a project. Yes, we did. Uh, one of our great achievements was uh, with the Japanese company, Jornek. Mm -hmm. It's a state company for oil, gas, and metals. We've been working with them for a very long time. Once we even organized a joint venture in Western Siberia, it was a very good oil field. And uh, we worked for two years on organizing that joint venture. Then some guys from Gazprom came and said, you know, we also like that field. They abandoned them immediately. They understood that they can do that nothing again. We found a company for the Irkutsk oil company in Yakutia and Irkutsk region. Mm -hmm. And they formed a joint venture, two joint ventures with that company. They are successful. And they managed to sell part of their uh, equity in, the, in one of the ventures 
two uh, consortium of two Japanese companies. Mm -hmm. So it, it's a success. Mm -hmm. But to find a company which is actually independent, mm -hmm. it, is, it is an exception. Irkutsk oil company is an exception. It's not a very big one. It is not dependent on the federal authorities. It has no relations with the, some corrupt structures or anything else. It took us quite a lot of uh, labor to do due diligence on the uh, Irkutsk oil company and on the safety of dealing with that. And it, it was a success. But if the, uh, you know, sometimes Gazprom is going to build a huge gas chemical uh, complex on the Baltic Sea, you know. Uh, first, Shell was in that project. But Shell was hoping to use particip participation in that, do this commercial project, only to, to get some advantages on Sakhalin. They wanted to become part of the Gazprom's some, some projects on Sakhalin. When they understood Gazprom is not going to do anything on Sakhalin with Shell, they dropped the project as soon as they heard that there will be chemical production as well. And the partner of Gazprom is an absolutely unknown small company which had no experience in building such complexes. And there is a huge problem how they are going to get uh, the stock for the uh, production of ethylene, polyethylene, and uh, polypropylene on that uh, factory. Because to, to do that, you need to get, they call it wet gas. In Russia, it is a fat gas. Gas which has, uh, is uh, with the components such as ethane, butane, propane, and so on. Not only methane, pure methane. And to, to get it from Western Siberia, from Yamal Peninsula to St. Petersburg or to Ust Luga with those components, it's a very expensive and dangerous business. You not do that. You transport methane, but not those components. We had some unhappy accidents with transporting such uh, wet gas. So we don't know what they are going to use as feedstock for the it's still a huge mark, huge question mark. So uh, I do not know any opportunities for large, respectable foreign companies to come in Russia and to work as producers of anything. Yes, suppliers of equipment. Okay. Thank you. Um, so that Pavel, you had a question? Okay. Well, I'm from St. Petersburg State University. Uh, Mikhail Ivanovich, thank you for the lecture. And I have three questions, but I do understand that the time is limited. Yeah. That's why we'll go one by one. So my first question is actually um, uh, is about the news from Amurska region from yesterday, where the new huge facility was opened by Mr. Putin yesterday. And can you please comment the project itself and helium? What the hell is about helium? Why the helium? Well, it's uh, we've been studying that project since uh, 2010. We have the feasibility study for that project. We studied all, all even the economic part of the feasibility study. It is the archive is 100 megabytes, and so it's a huge document. Maybe. If you put it on paper, it is one whole of the paper. Uh, at that time, Gazprom did not consider it economic enough. They could not find markets for that production first. It was, and they said, okay, maybe in that year, for two years, we will have a window of opportunity to export polyethylene to uh, India. Then in uh, Japan, for uh, 18 months, we will have a window of opportunity to export something there. So it was not exactly commercial because uh, the countries, the possible targets of marketing have their own petrochemical facilities and they want uh, feedstock. They do not want polyethylene to produce uh, maybe slippers or something, something out of that. Then, uh, 
the problem now with uh, with the that factory with that plant is uh, has been solved by the Chinese. The Chinese decided to join the project with Sibur. It is not Gazprom. Gazprom is not a very good player in petrochemicals. They produce the same, they export the same, they sell the same. But with the petrochemicals, Gazprom is part of the deal. They produce gas and uh, Sibur and the Chinese. In fact, this is a Chinese plant. They consider it as getting Russian gas, Russian feedstock to produce, to deliver it to China. It is on the Russian territory, but the Chinese can consider it part of the structure of petrochemical industries. It helps a lot. The problem is when the president says that the uh, factory will consume 38 billion cubic meters of natural gas, this is not so because to produce 38 billion cubic meters of methane and to deliver it to China, you should produce 42 billion cubic meters of natural gas because the rest is other components, including 7% of nitrogen, which nobody wants. Absolutely, you don't want to transport it because it's it's, it's uh, trash. Helium. Uh, gas from those fields contains quite a significant amount of helium. And uh, the Russian developers did not know what to, to do with that helium because the market was closed. The United States, uh, the Russia could satisfy all its requirements in helium from foreign workers. They did not want it in uh, Eastern Siberia or any Yakuti or any something like that. They do not know. And the Americans had enough halo accumulated to, to last for several years on the market. The market is absolutely non-existent. So the idea was to storage halo somewhere when the market will be good for halo. Then they decided to test membrane technology. Uh, they tested it. Uh, they said it's not economical. They dropped it. Now they will transport gas with helium from the field to uh, that factory and then recover helium and storage somewhere. We do not know where and how, because the, the original idea was at another place in the Amur region where they had absolutely no underground facilities for storage and helium. Nobody knew what to do with that. Now, hopefully, they found a new place where to put the helium on the ground and to wait until the market is very good. So, yes, that's, that's a good project from, uh, from the Chinese perspective. Mm -hmm. Are there any other questions? Uh, yeah, go ahead, you can ask. Okay, for so the second question, thank you. The second question is about uh, uh, global warming. Actually, as an expert, uh, do you see that investors or companies have started to include some risks um, connected with uh, permafrost, uh, etc., etc., uh, from global warming into their economic plans? Yes, the day before yesterday, I received the same question from from a client in Europe. Uh, I do not know. Because right now it is uh, all speculations. We do not, we cannot assess the effect on the sowing melting permafrost. It is melting, it is sowing. We know that the uh, thing from uh, those crystal hydrates is going into the atmosphere. And some uh, experts say that this is 30 billion cubic meters a year. You cannot catch it. On the shores, Arctic shores of the Laptev Sea or East Siberian Sea, uh, the permafrost is sowing, is melted, and there is a huge inflow of methane there. And methane is 300 times more dangerous as a greenhouse gas than CO2. Uh, we cannot catch it, 
we cannot cover that area with some sort of uh, uh, shroud or cloak and to get that gas. No, it is a, a huge, it's a huge danger. As to the danger to the industries which are produces, which are producing gas and oil in Arctic region, yes, I think they have not been affected yet. But uh, I heard an expert say, oh, it will be great. It will be just like uh, tropical weather on the Arctic coast and we will enjoy agriculture there. No, it will be marshland. And it will be very difficult to maintain the facilities that produce oil and gas in the Russian north if it is well one meter of water there instead of permafrost where they can get some sort of a solid foundation for the facilities and it will be very difficult it's difficult for example to produce oil and gas in the Caspian Sea in shallow waters it's either deep you, you know what to do with it but so they have to build artificial islands there or some dams in the Caspian Sea as the Kazakhs are doing and uh, in the Russian north to save it is too early because they have not been affected it's just speculation what they are going to do there, pipelines, wells, production facilities, living quarters. That's, that's, I think it's a huge danger, but we cannot uh, evaluate it uh, quantitatively. Yeah, something uh, to this question. I've seen an SP report very general that uh, was actually made, I think, to encourage companies to look more at the permafrost melting. Consequences and they put the figure for the infrastructure damage from permafrost melting at uh, 90 billion US dollars, uh, which is, well, I don't know where they got this figure, but still it's rather modest. If you think about the fact that the existing pipelines are aging and they, uh, well, are supposed to be replaced or somehow re uh, retrofitted anyway in, in the nearest future. I do not know anything about the veracity of that figure. It has been taken, I don't know where. We see that in the Arctic, oil and gas production has almost uh, stopped. There is no uh, ongoing pro project in Canada, in Alaska. They, they have stopped. They withdrew their forces, their facilities from there. In uh, Arctic waters, in the Barents Sea, beyond the polar circle, in Norway, they have two relatively small projects, uh, Holias and uh, Snowit. And they are not big projects and they are not very promising. In Russia, this is only Russia which is going to do something, such as Vostok oil. In the Arctic waters, we have just one uh, actually project, Perirazlovnaya. It is not a very good project and very com comfortable commercially, but uh, I don't know. It's, it's only Russia, which is going to, which is producing in the permafrost right now. If it reaches the facilities, well, we see now that sometimes gas comes out of permafrost and forming holes on the Yamal Peninsula. Nobody could explain what they create holes in those. Then they explained that, yeah, yes, it was uh, melting permafrost. It was the great salt. But uh, we still were going to, to see the consequences, not immediately. Yeah, may, may I just continue to, to oh, well, so thank you for the presentation. And um, I had one question uh, concerning Novatech, uh, I guess, Yamal and G. Um, uh, in your opinion, what's the reason for Novatech being exempt from uh, mineral tax, tax QC, uh, other than you know retaining uh, market share and um, uh, basically, um, yeah, what was your opinion on that? Just imagine, uh, well, such a situation. Mr. Michelson or Mr. Timchenko, who are the main owners of Novatech, come to the main decision makers in the, in the Kremlin and say, you know, you have a great plan for Arctic. And we are seeing that Gazprom cannot do anything. It has failed. 
with the Karasavi project, it has failed with Stockman project, with a lot of other projects in the Arctic. We see that the military cannot do anything just to establish Russia's presence along the coast. We can do that, and it will be a huge image building action. We are going to attract foreign capital, foreign uh, equipment and technologies, foreign investors, French, the Chinese, and we will do that. We will establish several projects, three projects, Arctic LNG, Yamal LNG, then uh, the base for uh, large scale constructions in Murmansk, reloading base in Murmansk. On the Kamchatka Peninsula, another reloading base for LNG. We will co cover the market of the Pacific market. We will uh, re uh, rejuvenate the Northern Sea route with our LNG carriers on one condition. We do not want to pay taxes first. Well, for 12 years, maybe. And then uh, please build us a uh, loading terminal. Uh, adopt some laws to exempt our project from uh, environmental damage that we are going to do to the bottom of the Arctic seas. And uh, well, some other, well, it's great for image. It's great for the geopolitical plan to establish Russia's presence along the Arctic coast. Yes, so coincided the interests of those investors and the geopolitical interests of the Russian political leaders. So it's not only about you know, the image of Russia's LNG uh, exporter, it's also about the Arctic presence. It's the same yeah. pieces of the same jigsaw puzzle. Yeah. Yes. It is for Putin, it is image building. Because I think for him, image building is much more important than uh, economy, economic considerations or anything else. So can we then expect uh, some taxes implemented in the nearest future? I think for 12 years. Uh, from now, <laughs> yes, I think some of the texts, okay. when they get enough money to come, they are already covering their expenses. When they get enough money to get satisfied, yeah, maybe, maybe they will sell that project to Rosnieff or, or someone else after 12 years of exploitation. Thank you. You're okay. uh, what was your th third question? Yeah, uh, my third question was about Mr. Sh 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 Stockman, exactly. Because like 20 or 15 years, uh, the whole story about Russian Arctic oil and gas production was about Stockholm, 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 Stockholm. And nowadays, where is Mr. Stockholm? What has happened to him? Well, Stockholm was uh, for the Russian uh, government. Uh, the idea of Stockholm was to uh, conquer at least 10% of the US gas market with Russian LNG from Stockholm. That was the idea. And some people even said at a conference in Buenos Aires, Russian officials, do the 20% of the American gas market. Well, it's a very complicated project. You cannot deliver electric power 650 kilometers from the shore. For example, just a small example. It is so many technical problems with the project. Yes, they say. Uh, I spoke with the Norwegian guy who was representing the Norwegian part of the project. He left the company. I spoke to him after that. And he said, well, with some tax encouragement, we could have done that. But in Russia, he omitted one word, uh, corruption. When he was speaking in Oslo, and we were speaking, we were delivering joint lecture. So corruption was also on the agenda because there was an idea, for example, in the independent observers believed that Russian officials in Gazprom, they were not interested materially in that project because the costs were so high, you couldn't add anything to steel first. And the, the presence of the French and the Norwegian participation but participants made it impossible to steal openly. So nobody was interested in the world. It just died out. Now, Rosneft says, okay, include Rosneft in the future plans of LNG production and urge. And they did, they included it. So this is the sample of absolutely impossible and non-realistic projects. 
which are included in the calculations of Russia's role on the LNG market. But it was uh, shale gas revolution which killed Stockman. Yes, yes, so it yes. was not just in the United States, they did yeah. that. No, no, demands, imports. no, imports. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, I'd also like to remind that, uh, you know, to our audience who are calling us on Zoom, that you can also uh, pose your questions, you know, put it in, in the chat section or raise your hand or turn your camera on. I know that we're actually basically out of time, but you know, in a sense of priority would be probably given to students at Venerable Program. I'm sorry for, for, for uh, doing this, but uh, unless our students have any questions or comments, either those who are present here or those who are on Zoom, then we could also uh, go ahead and ask others to their questions. But Tatiana, I think no, okay. Yeah, uh, thank you very much for such an exciting uh, lecture. It's really interesting to hear. Uh, my name is Tatiana Gubichuk, and uh, I'm from an NFO program, and I got really short question. Uh, how do, how, what do you think should be changed in uh, regulation of uh, oil and gas? Like in five years, uh, whether you imagine you're like uh, the chief of uh, uh, oil and gas industry. Yes, I think the main idea is to get stability and uh, fiscal stability, tax stability for a project. It's a very long term project. Every one of them are long term, so they need it. There was a very good tool for that, which was called production sharing agreements. So from the very beginning, there is an agreement between the investors and the government. How much taxes, how much share of production the government is going to get from each of the stages of the project. And the taxes or the shares of production are fixed in the agreement and no changes in the legislation of the host country can, can change that production sharing agreement. It is guarantees of stabilization. In Russia, we have three projects based on production sharing agreements, Sakhalin 1, Sakhalin 2, and Haryaga. Haryaga is now a small project, and the French are there in that project, and now, now it's, it's not important. Let's forget. Sakhalin 1 and Sakhalin 2. Sakhalin 1, we have Rosneft's participation in that project with 20%. And Sakhalin uh, 2, Gazprom entered the project under huge uh, uh, administrative pressure on the uh, partners, and they got uh, the controlling uh, package. Now, when the Russian government officials say that PSA, production sharing agreements, are a, well, uh, they are a treachery to Russia's national interests, such agreements are good for colonial nations and so on. This is, this is not so. Why Gazprom and Rosneft are uh, traitors to the national <laughs> interest? Get to know. They are, they operate perfectly well. Russia gets a lot of money, a lot of uh, taxes. Sakhalin, the regional government, gets a lot of taxes, not only the federal budget. But there is belief in the Russian government that those are not good. Mr. Putin in the year 2002 said, okay, our hope is with production sharing agreements. A couple of years, less than two years later, he said, no, that's not, that's not good. He changed his opinion. And then there were some amendments to the Russian legislation making it absolutely impossible. Now we have to do now, stability, stability. That, that's what they need. Thank you. Um, I see a question from, uh, sorry, uh, from Anton Berezutsky. Question is, uh, thank you for your lecture. The notion of Russian lobby in the EU behind Nord Stream 2 is widely acknowledged in the media. Do you think it is plausible to consider that lobbying behind Nord Stream 2 is conducted by the companies from Nord Stream 2 consortium, NGO, and VEPs, etc.? And it, and it involves Opal and EUGAL operators onshore extensions of um, Nord Stream 2. Gazprom and Russia in general have a specific image in Europe nowadays, so it is practical to transfer lobbying duties to the established partners within the EU. Well, I don't think this is as simple as that. 
First, there is no consortium. There are several companies that uh, provide money to the project, to the undersea project. Uh, that part of it, five companies are providing. They are not partners in the consortium, they are just co financiers. They are not part, of, yes, I think they constitute part of the lobby, but the main lobby is uh, in the political establishment of Germany, Austria, and some other countries in Europe, not, not those companies. Uh, that are co financiers Well, it's it's so large a question about this project that it will take us about two more hours to describe who gets what, <laughs> whom it was profitable to promote the project, how the Americans managed to bury it first and then to revive it next. So it's sorry, sorry, but we do not have some time to discuss that. All right. I believe. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Well, thank you very much. Uh, thank you again. Uh, thanks, Dr. Kudikin, for your great presentation and then talk and, and answers. Thank you all for your questions. I think we're by now it's really more than more than one, one and a half hours announced uh, uh, previously. This record this recording will be posted later on our YouTube channel, so please follow that um, to all of you who have joined us later. Um, like to thank you once again. We will finish the event now, and maybe we can have a few more minutes just to interact here if you if you have the time for that. Thank you.